Good evening to everyone. Certainly hope that your day has been a good one. I know it's been a warm one, and I am glad that we can be together tonight, have this opportunity to worship in spirit and in truth. Appreciate Brother Mark sharing those announcements with us about the things that are going on, and there certainly is a great deal going on in the congregation here, and we are thankful for that. And I hope you'll take advantage of the opportunities that we, we have to serve the Lord, and to grow in our knowledge and to grow closer to each other. And if you're not uh, involved the way that you would like to be, I would encourage you, go to the elders, go to the deacons and, and let them know, hey, I, I wanna be a worker. Is there something that I can be involved in? Let them know some of the things that you like to do and, and they will be happy to put you to work. We always need workers in the kingdom. We're the body of Christ together. And every part of the body has a function. And so we all need to work together in this great cause that God has given us as his church. If you have your Bible with you, I want you to open it up to Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24, as tonight we're going to talk about what happens on the road to Emmaus. When you get to Luke chapter 24 you find that Jesus has been crucified and his body has been laid in the tomb. That, that's what happens in chapter 23 as Luke records it. And then in chapter 24, you read about what happens on the first day of the week. The women, the women who had ministered to Jesus throughout his earthly ministry had noted where his body had been laid. They had prepared spices and ointment. And, and after the Sabbath, they intended to go to that tomb and further prepare his body for burial. Luke's account tells us that they were concerned about this stone that was in front of the opening. But when they got there, it had already been rolled away. They go inside the tomb, and they find it empty. It's then that two men in glowing apparel appear unto them, evidently angelic beings, and they say unto them, Why seek the living among the dead? Don't you remember what he told you before all this transpired? How he said that he would be crucified that he would be laid in the tomb and he would rise again. And it has happened as he has told you. They were beside themselves, these women that were there. A few of them are named Mary Magdalene and Joanna is talked about and, and Mary, the mother of James and a few other women that were with them. And one of the first things they do is to go to the apostles and those that were with the apostles and tell them of all the things that they have witnessed. The apostles won't believe them. Peter runs to the tomb. He finds it empty. But all he can really do is wonder about the things that he has heard. And that leads us to about verse 13, where we want to begin tonight talking about what happens on the road to Emmaus. What we're going to do is look at the text from verse 13 to verse 34. Then we're going to come back at the close of our lesson and look at three lessons for you and for me today. So let's begin there at verse 13. The Bible is going to tell us, and behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. You know, we today still don't know exactly the location of this place called Emmaus. But we do know that it was this three score fur furlongs or about seven miles from Jerusalem. Now in our day, that's a long way to walk, isn't it? But in their day, that's just a couple hours. And so they make their way to Emmaus. Verse 14, and they talk together of all these things which had happened. Here's what's on their heart. They're talking 
to each other about Jesus, about all the things that have happened in Jerusalem, the things that they have heard about his resurrection. Verse 15 says, And it came to pass that while they communed together in reason, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they should not know him. The New King James says that they, their eyes were restrained. They were held back. They were not able to see that it was Jesus. It's interesting when we look at the appearances of Jesus following his resurrection. There are some things that are a little unusual. There are times when people do not recognize him, at least not at, not at first. Here, for instance, their eyes were, were holding. There were times, like we read about in John chapter 20, when the doors were shut and Jesus appeared in the midst of them. How did he do that? Well, we're not given that information. And so we're left to just wonder a little bit about those things. But here we're told that their eyes were, were held so that they could not recognize Jesus. They were restrained in this way. Verse 17 tells us, And he said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk and, and are sad? What are you talking about? That's what he wants to know. But did you notice also that Jesus, he understands that they're sad. Folks, do you realize that Jesus knows what we're feeling? He knows when we're happy. He knows when we are troubled. He knows when we are sad, when our hearts are heavy. He knows. I think that's all the more reason for us to continue going to him in prayer. You, you, you can fool some other people. You know, they ask you how you do it, and you say, fine. You put that smile on, and they never know what's behind. Jesus knows. And even more, he cares. And so he wonders as he speaks to them, what are you talking about? Why, why are you sad? Verse 18, and one of them, whose name was Cleophas, answering, said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast not known the things which are come to pass there in, in these days? He, he thinks that's the only way that this is possible. Because everybody in this area knows what's happened over the last few days. The only way that he would not know, this person would not know, is that he's just come into the area. He doesn't know, he hasn't heard the news. Everybody knows. It's interesting to me, here, Jesus is going to be taught about Jesus. These two are going to share information with Jesus about the Son of God. And so, he continues, verse 19, And he said unto him, What things? And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth which was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. Now the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. We thought, he would be the one to redeem Israel. Of course, they didn't understand the nature of the kingdom at this time. Many of them were thinking that it was going to be a, an earthly kingdom. He's going to be the one who's going to deliver us from this Roman oppression. We are going to be a free nation again, and we're going to be able to do the things that we want to do and not have to give an account to anyone else. And, and, and it's going to be like in the days of David or in the days of Solomon where Israel has made this great and powerful nation once again. Well, that is not the nature of the kingdom of our Lord. Remember what he told Pilate. 
My kingdom is not of this world. It's not a physical kingdom. You're not going to be able to say that it's in this location or in this spot on the map. No, it's, he reigns in the hearts of men and women. And so it's a spiritual kingdom, the church that Jesus came to establish. But, but they failed to understand that, at least many of them did. And they said, and, and, and it's the third day. The third day. You know, Jesus had said some things about the third day. I, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, he had told them. I'm going to be abused and misused there. And they are going to crucify me, and I'm going to rise the third day. They didn't understand what that meant. But I do know this, the enemies of Jesus took note of it, because when they spoke to Pilate, about trying to make sure that the body of Jesus stayed in the tomb, they told Pilate, we remember, in Matthew chapter 27, we, we remember that that deceiver they called him told people that he's going to raise the third day. And so Pilate go, tells them, go and make it as secure as you can, and, and that's what they do. But here are these men thinking about the third day. They've heard the rumor, what these women have seen, the empty tomb, and they're wondering what all this can mean. Verse 22 says, Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said. But him they saw not. And so they preached to Jesus, Jesus, the things that have transpired. Well, in verse 25, Jesus is going to respond. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now look at this, verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Folks, I wish... We had a copy of that sermon. Wouldn't it be incredible to hear Jesus expound on what the prophets of old had written about him? Starting at Moses. What did Moses say about Jesus? All oh, that God is going to raise up a prophet like unto me. Maybe he spoke of David and the things that are written in the book of Psalms about our Lord, how his body would not see corruption, how, how his enemies would be made his footstool. Maybe, maybe he spoke of Isaiah's prophecies, how that he would be born of a virgin, how he would be the suffering servant and pay the debt for our transgressions. Maybe he mentions Micah's prophecy about where he would be born, or Zacharias about how he would come into the city on the donkey. He expounds unto them all that the prophets had written about him. Well, in verse 28 then, we're told, and they drew nigh unto the village, whither they went, and he, he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. It came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave to them, and their eyes were open. They'd been restrained until this point. Now their eyes are open, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And so just as quickly as he had come to them, he was now departed. What are they going to do? 
Verse 32 says, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Really what they're saying is, we should have known. We should have realized that this was Jesus, the risen Savior, speaking unto us. And then verse 33 says, And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And so here is this encounter on the road to Emmaus where Jesus speaks to these two men, one of them by the name of Cleopas, and he talks to them about the things that the prophets had said would come to pass concerning Jesus. And so they are eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Christ. Well, having looked at these things, I want us to notice three lessons for us tonight. The first one is this. We need to talk about Jesus. We need to talk about Jesus, just like these men were doing. If you go to verse 14, the Bible says, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. They were talking about all the things that had happened to Jesus. The trial, the abuse that he endured, the crucifixion, the burial, and even the rumor of of his resurrection. They were spending time talking about Jesus. You know, we are a people, most of us, who are really good at talking. We like to talk. Now, you may not like to talk in front of a group. I understand that kind of thing. But to individuals, to friends, we we love to talk. We talk about all kinds of things, don't we? Anybody spend any time talking about politics? I imagine that we do. Anybody talk about sports? Anybody talk about family? Anybody talk about the price of things at the grocery store? Anybody talk about the weather? Anybody have a good story they like to share? We love to talk. Folks, it's okay to talk about all of those things, whatever it is that might come to to our minds, those, those wholesome things. But folks, the most important thing that we could be talking about is something that we seem to be avoiding. We need to be talking to others about Jesus. We need to do that with one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to talk to each other about the Lord and about His Word and about His church. And we need to be talking to our neighbors and our friends and our co-workers about the Lord and about His church. I know that that a lot of times we feel like, well, I'm going to be the best example that I can be And that example will lead them to Christ. I pray that it will. Someone told me something a long time ago. We're so concerned about upsetting people. You know, we've got to be tactful. He said, it's more important to make contact than it is to use tact. And that's true. We've got to make contact. I'm not talking about being abusive. I've had brothers and sisters in Christ that have been that way, who have knocked on a person's door, and when they refused a Bible study, shouted at them, well, you're going to hell. How's that going to work? Not very well most of the time. But folks, there are ways for us to talk about the Lord and His church. You're going to meet people... Not tomorrow, most of you have the day off probably, but but Tuesday you go back to work and people are going to ask you, what would you do? What do you tell them? 
Oh, well, Friday night we went and saw some fireworks or Saturday night or whatever it might have been. Or, you know, I did this or that over the weekend. We had a family get together or whatever it was. How about you start out with this? What'd you do over the weekend? Well, the first thing we did, we went to worship. Then you could tell them all those other things. We went to worship. And tell them good things about the church. Listen. Don't complain to the world about the church. Trying to win people to Christ. Tell them the good. There's so much good. You, know, to, you come here and you hear all kinds of stories. You meet with folks. You talk with them before. You talk with them after. You folks know that we have a, a couple that just got back from Hawaii. And they were talking about their church. And I didn't even ask about, I said, how did it go? The first thing that, that I was told was, we went to church. And we got there. And we had a rental car. And the alarm went off. And we didn't know how to shut it off. We thought we were going to just sneak into this little congregation, you know. And for five minutes, the alarm is blaring. Well, here we are, you know. I met a 90-year-old man this morning, just turned 90. And one of the first things he said to me was, Tim, you know what? Old soldiers never die. They just smell that way. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that you hear. Good, people who are in need, to talk about to others in the world, about the Lord's church and about our Lord. We need to be talking about Him. And you know you do that. I'm not saying that every word out of your mouth needs to be that. I, I, but you know when you do those kinds of things, just a little, little thought, you're planting a seed. And it may take a while to germinate, but you know what's going to happen somewhere down the road? Those people that you're talking to, some of them are going to run into some hardships. That's part of life. And when they do, more than likely, they're, they're going to come to you. I know Tim, he, he, he goes to church. I don't know where he goes to church. Except, where did he tell me? And, you know, I, but I, I can go and talk to him about this. Maybe, maybe he'll pray for me. Maybe he'll pray with me. You see, you, you keep planting that seed talking about the Lord. These men, as they were walking along, were talking about the things that had happened. They were talking about Jesus. And we want to be people who talk about the Lord and His church. Here's the second thing I want to share with us, and that is, you, you don't, don't lose hope. Don't lose your hope. These men had you look at verse 21 and you read them saying, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. We thought, we thought things were going to change. We, we thought this kingdom was coming, this earthly kingdom, and, and, and now they put him to death. Their hopes were dashed. They'd lost their hope. And I want to encourage us as Christians, don't ever lose your hope. You hold on to it. No matter what you're going through, you, you hold on to the hope that is given to us in Christ. The writer of Hebrews tells us that that hope is the anchor of our soul. You don't lose your anchor. It holds you in place. It'll keep you from drifting away. You know, the devil, he, he, he loves, he loves to work in such a way to try and make a Christian or to tempt a Christian to give up his or her hope. He likes that. And, and sadly, it's worked on some Christians throughout the ages. It's one of the most effective tools that, that he has. Hard times... Why are, you, why are you going through those? Just for Christ? Give that up. It'll be easy. The easiest thing to do is what? N nothing. So just give up. That's what he wants. 
we can't be those people. And so when we face our difficulties, our hardships, we're going to hold on to the hope. Even when we face the most difficult of times. Friday, Tammy and I made a trip over to to New Philadelphia because a brother in Christ had, had passed away. His name was Dick McCoy. His dear friend. We teased quite a bit because I'm a Hatfield, he's a McCoy. We had a lot in common, and we, we would spend time talking with each other. And, and I, I, I love the way that he was a grandpa. He was a little older than me. And I'm telling you that he and his wife, I don't, I, I've never known, and, and I'm sure that there are folks here that are the same way, but they went to everything they possibly could that their grandkids were involved in. I mean, they were going to be there no, no matter what, and, unless it was a church, they, they were going to be there. And I think Tammy saw that, and she's making me do that now, but, and, and that's okay, that, that's good. But, you know, we went, and, and there was sorrow. I mean, he and his wife had been married for 56 years. That, that's hard. Those kids were having to say so long for a little while to their dad and to their grandpa. That's hard. But what's the Bible tell us about that? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it lets us know that as Christians, yes, we mourn. But we do not mourn as those who have no hope. That's what sustains us. When I was talking to his children, I, I reminded them, this is what he lived for, to get ready for this time. And our sadness, we know it, it's not for him. It's for us when we have to say goodbye. But we hold on to that hope. When you think about the reunions that will take place in just a little while, if we hold on to that hope in Christ, don't let the devil rob you of it. You hold on to your hope in Christ. Here's number three, the last one I'll share with us, and that is there needs to be an urgency with the gospel. Do you notice what those men did, those two that he spoke to? You know, after that it was revealed to them that they were with Jesus, and he disappears, what, what do they do? Just before they had said, why don't you come on in? It's late, you know, and, and, and you just stay with us. They just made a seven-mile journey. And when they got the word that this was Jesus, whoom, they're out the door, and they're headed back to meet with the apostles. They didn't say, hey, let's get a good night's sleep, and in the morning, we'll, we'll make this trip. No. It was already late, but they're going to go. Why? Because this news was too important. Folks, we need to understand there is a, an urgency in sharing the gospel. Our world can't wait. Our friends, our neighbors, our loved they can't wait. We need to be doing it now. It's not one of those things I'm going to get to one of these days. Or I'll get around to it. Do it now. It's too urgent. Several years ago, Tammy and I made a trip to a veterans hospital up toward Cleveland. Her uncle, Steve, was there. He was very ill. And we went to see him. We left after a few minutes of visiting with him, and we were walking down the hall. And Tammy looked at me and she just said, Tim, would you please go back and ask him if he wants to be baptized? I, I said, sure. I, she said, I can't. She was too emotional, probably thinking this was the last time she had seen him. And I said, sure, I'll go back. And I went back, and I, 
I, I talked to Steve a little bit. And I explained, listen, I, I know your situation is bad, but if you want to be baptized, I will make it happen. I, I don't care if I have to go buy a pool or if we have to use some facility here, whatever, we'll, we'll make it happen. And he said, thank you, Tim, I, I'm okay. He died the next day. I would have hate to have walked away from there and said, Tammy, I, I'll ask him the next time. I wish I could tell you a better ending to the story that he was uh, baptized into Christ. But you know that we, we can't control that. But what we can control is what we do with the gospel. And it's up to us to share it. And there needs to be an urgency with this message. And so you look at, at what happens here on the road to Emmaus. These two men are witnesses, eyewitnesses, to the resurrected Christ. And they teach us some, some great lessons How about, about talking about Jesus and about, about holding on to our hope and, and the urgency of, of spreading the gospel sharing the gospel. But before we close, I want to just share one more little thought with you. We'll use it as a way of invitation. And that is simply this. Will you invite the Lord to abide with you? You know, that's what these men did. They traveled to Emmaus and things were getting late and, and they thought Jesus was going to travel on, but... Instead, they invited him to come in and abide with them. And I just want to ask you tonight, will you ask Jesus to abide with you? Now, if you've already obeyed the gospel, you've already done that. But if you haven't yet put on Christ in baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, you need to ask the Lord to abide with you. And you do that through obeying His will. And we'd love to assist you in your baptism into Christ tonight. And so if you're subject in any way, if you need to obey the gospel or, or if you need to come back, we're singing this song of encouragement for you. We encourage you to come as we stand and sing this good song.